This is an image of the Gronda nuclear plant in Germany. This particular plant actually has been decommissioned recently as Germany switches to more renewable resources. But that brings up the question, nuclear energy, what is it? Is it safe? Is it clean? Should we be investing in nuclear energy? Are there other energies that are more reliable, that are safer? Nuclear energy really needs to be a part of this conversation. So in this video, we'll talk about nuclear energy, how it's produced, and some of the safety implications that go along with it. Let's get started. So we start with just sort of a definition. What is nuclear energy? Well, you learned in chemistry, right, that atoms that make up all living things have nuclei or a nucleus. Well, within that nucleus, there is a certain amount of energy because the power holding the nucleus together is a very strong force. So nuclear energy really comes from the nucleus because all of these protons and neutrons here in the center are held together very tightly. Then of course you have the electrons going around, but the real big force is here with the protons and neutrons. So what are some trends that we're noticing? Before we get into the details about how nuclear energy works, what are some trends that we see? Well, right now, we have roughly 400 reactors in 32 countries around the world. You can see specifically a lot more here in Europe, but in the US, um, Asia, as well as parts of South America, there is nuclear energy being used, and it produces probably up to about 10% of the world's energy right now. That number varies depending on where you look. I've seen five to 10 to 15, so I settled roughly on it about 10% of the world's energy. Now, if we zoom in to the United States, we actually have about a quarter of those reactors, 92 reactors in 28 states. I'm in North Carolina, and we actually have a few reactors here. In the United States, however, that nuclear energy produces about 20% of our electricity in the United States. Notice there's a lot more over here sort of on the East Coast than in the Central or western part of the United States. So what are we getting? How are we getting our electricity? How are we generating that? So fossil carbon has continued to make a move um, in terms of how we get our energy from fossil fuels. Nuclear, as you know, it kind of took off and then it's stayed relatively the same since uh, you know the 80s. And I'll talk in a minute about why that probably happened. Um, and then renewable energy, notice that that's what's really been taking off. As I mentioned in the last video, if you watch that, that uh, wind and solar power are really generating a lot of electricity for us. So now let's look here about the history of global nuclear power. So if you notice, 1960, we started building, and these bars right here are number of reactors. And so you can see that we start going up, right, really big. Why we're under construction here. And then we kind of peaked here in the 80s. We had a few incidents, Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, which I'll talk about in a minute, that may have slowed down some of our nuclear energy power. So this line here, since about 1985, 1990, we stayed about the same in our terms of active reactors. We have a lot more installed capacity than we actually realize in terms of our nuclear industry, but it's gradually moved up um, or from the 60s through the 80s, but then it stayed pretty even as we've moved into the 2020s. All right, so let's talk about how nuclear reactions occur and what are the types. You've probably heard the two types of nuclear reactions are fission and fusion. Well, realistically, fission is the only one that we truly have a grasp on. That's what all of our power plants are using, a fission reaction. I'll talk about fusion in a moment, but fission is really what we're using currently. So fission is when the nucleus of an atom splits into two or more smaller nuclei. 
what we get is some gamma rays and some energy released. So how does this happen? So this is an induced fission reaction. So induced means we made it happen. So we're take, what we do is we take a neutron and we induce or aim it at a 235 isotope of uranium. So uranium is the only naturally occurring fissile or fissionable element that we have. So we use uranium in all these reactions. So we send a neutron. So if you take the 235 plus one more neutron, we get 236 as our total mass here, protons and neutrons. That makes 236 uranium. Now, uranium at 236 is a very unstable. So it creates this for just a moment and then it divides or fissiles into um, 92 krypton and 141 barium. Notice that these are smaller than the original heavy uranium. Now, what does that do? Okay, so we get a little gamma ray, we get some more neutrons released, but we also get a ton of energy in this reaction, okay? So this is the basis of nuclear reactions, getting nuclear energy. It's bombarding uranium with a neutron to create 236 uranium, which then divides uh, up into these two other smaller nuclei. Now, this is how we do one. But in reality, right, this is gonna create some energy, but at a nuclear plant, we'd need to create a lot more. So we need a fission chain reaction. So basically it's the same thing. We'd send a neutron towards 235 uranium, which then, of course, splits into two smaller ones. But remember I said there were these neutrons that were given off? Well, great news. Those neutrons can then be to start a chain reaction, go to another uranium, another uranium, which then starts a chain reaction, more neutrons, and it goes on and on. So notice we get energy there, energy there, energy there, energy there. This nuclear chain reaction then can run our nuclear power plants. Okay, so what about fusion? I mentioned fission. That's what all of our nuclear power plants are, do, power plants are doing. Fusion is very theoretical. In fact, we've done it, but it's really more kind of a dream at this point. Um, a few weeks ago, I'm recording this in 2022, a few weeks ago, there was some news about um, fusion reaction actually releasing more energy than we put into it. So there are advances being made, right? The, the goal would be cold fusion, where we're getting a lot more energy than we have to put into it. But basically what fusion is, is it's a nuclear reaction where two or more nuclei are combined, right? So we're going from smaller to bigger. We take two smaller ones, put them into a bigger one. That produces or absorbs energy. So how does this work? So let me give you the most simple fish, excuse me, fusion reaction. If you take deuterium and tritium, so here's deuterium, right? Here's hydrogen, one proton, one neutron, right? Got a mass of two. Then we take tritium, hydrogen with one proton, right? It's still got one proton, so it's hydrogen. But then it's got two neutrons, so it's got a total mass of three. If you combine these, what happens is we get a lot of energy because notice, you take two protons, three neutrons, well, that will make helium, which has two protons, with their two neutrons, but it notice it sends this other neutron off. And notice that we get some energy, some voltage created from that particular reaction. Okay, so this would be our most simple fusion reaction that we could do. Now, where else do we, do we know fusion reactions can work? Do we see it anywhere else? Well, absolutely. In fact, our sun and smaller stars like our sun um, is actually just a giant fusion, re fusion reaction because we're taking lighter elements like hydrogen and combining them into heavier elements like helium, and then those combine into other elements, et cetera, et cetera. So our sun is actually just a giant fusion reaction taking place over time. Okay, so fission, fusion, those are the two types of reactions. Now I wanna talk about how a nuclear power plant actually works. And this may surprise you. 
when I, when I, you know, as a kid, I'd heard about nuclear power and what's really going on. You know, I, t- I had this image of, okay, atoms splitting and then all that energy went right into the grid. It's actually not how it works. What happens is the nuclear energy just is used to create a steam generator, right? So in its, it, as fancy as it may seem, all the nuclear power, the splitting of the atom, is really just about making water hot, okay? So let's go over how that actually works. If you look at a picture of a nuclear power plant, a lot of people think, oh, what's all this stuff coming down the top? Kim, eh, it's just water, just steam. So two different types of reactors, a boiling water reactor, pressurized water reactor. Now there are some more types, but these are the two most commonly used boiling water and pressurized water reactor. So those are the ones I'm gonna go over. So what happens is you have here, and this looks very complicated. I'm not gonna go over every detail. I just wanna point out a few things. Right here is our reactor pressure vessel. Here, as you can see in the center, those are our nuclear fuel elements and our control rods. This is where the nuclear reaction is taking place. So what happens? As you can see, moving across here, what we have is water being pumped through here, cools it off. When that happens, what we're doing, this nuclear reaction, is releasing so much energy, notice it goes from cool water to hot water. Now in this boiling water reactor type, what's really created is this hot water then goes, turns a generator right here, right, the steam turns a generator to make electricity. So in a way, nuclear energy with all its um, amazing technology is really just like an old steam engine in a way, right? Because the steam is what is creating the uh, electricity through the generator. Now, I have another example here. This one's a little animated, so it might help you a little more. This is a pressurized water reactor. The only difference is that instead of boiling water, this heated water is pressurized and kept from boiling. All right, so what's happening? Once again, we got our reactor vessel. That's where the um, fission reaction is taking place. We got our control rods keeping things going. And what happens is we're moving water. Lots of water's being moved, moves through here. Now what happens? Our reactor vessel, a lot of energies create. What does that do? Warms up the water. The pressurizer keeps it from um, boiling, but it still creates steam. That steam then goes to the turbine, rotates it, which is attached to the generator, which then of course puts the electricity into our grid, powering our cities. So once again, nuclear power is really just using the nuclear energy to heat up water so that we can get a generator going. Okay, so we've mentioned uranium. Uranium, I told you, is very radioactive. In fact, all the isotopes of uranium are unstable. That's why this is really radioactive because that atom of uranium is so unstable, right? Um, It is happy to undergo these fission reactions. So what do we know about uranium? Well, it takes several steps, and I'm gonna go over this size thing in a moment. But how do we get uranium? Can you just go and pick it up, you find it in a field or something? No, actually there's a few steps to actually get the uranium that's usable for our nuclear reactions. One, we have to mine it, right? And um, uraninite is also, also called pitch blend, is a common ore that we get uranium from, okay? And we can we actually have some uranium in the United States, a, a large amount actually up in Canada, um, uh, some over in Kazakhstan and Australia, actually there's a quite, quite a big uh, deposit of uranium. So there is a lot of uranium on our planet. We just have to mine it. And then the trickier part is enriching it because there's not a ton of uranium actually in here. What we need to do is enrich it to the uranium-235 that is actually the fissile, fissile material that we can use. How does this process happen? It uses something called gaseous diffusion, where we are diffusing across a semi-permeable membrane, separating 
that enriched uranium into what we need in the 235. So then here we need to store it. Notice we got all this gas diffusion, sort of the same thing happening here, in storage until it's ready to use that uranium. Okay, so how much does it take to run a nuclear reactor? Well, actually not as much as you might think. So one uranium pellet, which I found a lot of resources that compared it to the size of a gummy bear. So one pellet is actually, will give us the same energy as a ton of coal, okay? And that may not look like a big bag, but think about if you've seen these pallets and how big these pallets are, think about a ton, 2,000 pounds of coal, what that is, and then also 150 gallons of oil. And to show you what 150 gallons of oil is, uh, if you've been out in the country, a lot of people that have their oil in tanks outside will keep it in something like this. These are typically 150 gallon containers. So this versus this versus this. Obviously, this is, we're getting a lot more bang for our buck, so to speak, from a uranium pellet versus all of this coal and oil. Okay, so then the question comes up, what about the waste? What do we do with all, <clears throat> excuse me, this nuclear waste? Well, what we know is that about 95% of that depleted uranium, right, once it's used, is, store, is stored as something called uranium hexafluoride, okay? These we put in steel cylinders in these open yards um, close to the enrichment plants. We do know, however, that up to 95% of that can be recycled, all right? So it's not like we're just creating this huge abundance of waste that we'll never be able to do anything with. We know that actually quite a bit of it can be recycled. Now that, of course, costs its own energy and there are other things that go into it, but know that uranium can be recycled. So here's a typical um, uranium hexafluoride storage yard. You can see all of these specific canisters. So here are some cylinders that you would typically store these things in. There's a person, just so you can see the size of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we also have what we call dry cask storage. This is where we house those nuclear, those spent nuclear fuel assemblies um, until they're ready to be taken other places, okay? So nuclear energy does make waste, however, as I mentioned, 95% um, of that can be recycled if we just invest and do what we need to do with it. All right, so what about the safety? Is it safe? We had a string there of some disasters, which really scared, I think, the uh, populations around the world about nuclear power. Through My Island happened in 1979. This is actually in Pennsylvania. There's a big scare um, with a nuclear disaster then we had perhaps the most famous of all, Chernobyl, in 1986. And what you see here is actually the city next to the power plant, which has been abandoned. It's kind of sad. Um, actually, this is like a Ferris wheel. Really, I don't know why that's so sad. Um, but this city is no longer can be occupied because there's still radioactive material coming off of Chernobyl. And then more recently, perhaps in your lifetime, um, Fukushima which it was in Japan, or is in Japan, um, as a result of some really big, I think it was a tsunami um, that was so close, it really did some damage, and we were worried about Fukushima um, and all the radioactive material that was happening there. So, is it safe? Well, we've had three kind of disasters, but what we have to do is we have to put this in perspective. Okay, so despite all of these things, we have to really look at the data. So actually what we know is that today, nuclear energy is safer than most other energy plants. And this chart down here does, it's really interesting, it, it does a good job of showing the safety of some of these. And what it does is it use, uses the death rate measured as deaths per terawatt of energy production. So coal, which is 25% of our global energy, um, has roughly 24.6 deaths for every terawatt of energy produced, right? A lot of people actually die in these coal mines or in these plants um, getting this coal to us. Oil, a little more, 31%, but has fewer deaths, which is still, though, 263 times higher than nuclear 
energy deaths that occur. So the interesting thing here is as we go down, right, coal, oil, more deaths in getting the energy, natural gas, biomass, but also look over here at greenhouse gas emissions. Look at all of these greenhouses, all this carbon dioxide, these top three are putting into our environment. And then when you look down here at these, fewer deaths, nuclear, wind, solar, fewer greenhouse gas emissions in our environment. Clearly, we see the way to go here, right? If we want to take care of our planet, if we want to protect people, okay? So even though we've had disasters, we need to remember and think about what is best in terms of the data and really what's going to limit the amount of greenhouse. Okay, so one of the big drawbacks though to nuclear is the expense. It is very expensive and costs are going up. So actually a new about 1100 megawatt plant is estimated to cost between six and nine billion, right? So that's a staggering amount of money to make a nuclear power plant, which is why one of the reasons why we don't see near as many plants being built. <clears throat> Here's a great little graph. Shows the trends in the cost of energy uh, from 2010 to 2019. Um, notice solar was way up. Solar was very expensive, but notice drastically how much it's come down. Wind has come down. Onshore and offshore wind use for energy has come down. Coal stayed relatively about the same. More expensive than onshore wind, in incidentally. But notice what's happened to nuclear. It has gone up, okay? So the cost of nuclear is one of the big considerations we have to think about when we're planning energy for the future. So I want to leave you with this last slide, which is the impact on the environment. I want to give you some pros and cons. So remember, what is nuclear energy doing? It's actually using a large amount of water, which is one of the cons, to use the fissile material to heat it up so that we can get steam generated to make power. So using large amounts of water is a con, right? Especially in a world where water is scarce. Waste is a problem, right? I talked to you about storing that radioactive material. And we do have the possibility of some of those radioactive disasters that we've talked about. Okay, that's the cons. Let's talk about the pros. One, perhaps one of the biggest, releases very little carbon into our atmosphere. This is not a fossil fuel plant. This is a nuclear plant releasing steam, releasing water into our atmosphere, right? Not a lot of carbon. We also know that a nuclear releases very little pollution. If you're looking at a coal plant, right, or a oil plant, you're putting a lot of pollution into the atmosphere. Another nice thing about nuclear is that it's on all the time. We don't have to wait for the sun to come out for solar. We don't have to wait for the winds to blow to get wind. We can actually be on all the time with nuclear energy. And this doesn't take a lot of land use, right? For solar plants, we're going to need a lot of land to put up those solar panels. Same thing for wind. We need a lot, quite a bit of wind out on um, a field. Excuse me, we need a lot of land for the wind out in that field. So I want you to just consider the cons and the pros, the pros and the cons to um, using nuclear energy. I would propose, though, that, see my clever little design here, nuclear energy has to be a part of the puzzle, right? We can't completely rely on it, but we can't at the same time throw it away either, okay? So hopefully this has helped you understand a little bit more about nuclear energy and the process whereby which we use fissile material to create energy.